Um, so you may be wondering why it is that uh, an Englishman stands here in front of you today and my story starts really when I was uh, when I was a kid as all of our stories begin and I used to be very 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 disconnected very very depressed no real sense of purpose no direction um, really ended up living somebody else's life and I ended up as a stockbroker in the city of London sitting behind a desk and one day I woke up and I said to myself I knew that on the outside I had pretty much everything you could want but on the inside, I had pretty much nothing you could want, or anyone would want. And I woke up one morning and I realized to myself, I said, I said, this is it. For the rest of my life, I'm going to be depressed. I'm going to live someone else's life. And this is just it. This is just how my life is going to be. And what had happened in that moment is I'd given up. And you'll, you'll find out later that I'm not the type of chap to give up. But in that moment, I gave up. And I realized a couple of hours later that I was not going to give up. And that there was no way that I was going to live an uninspired life. There was no way that I was not going to make the most of my time on this little blue planet of ours. It just wasn't going to happen. And I was going to do everything in my power to make sure that I lived fully. Now, it didn't just happen like that. And uh, I continued working in the office. I continued being disconnected. I continued making the wrong choices. And I really continued not living fully. But then, it all changed. But before we get to the all changed part, how many of you have an iPhone? Or an Android? Or anything that's smart? <laughs> okay. How many of you have a dumb phone? Okay. Oh, you have a dumb phone. Good. Actually, I have a dumb phone too. Let me show you. Where's my dumb phone? Well, it's somewhere. It's a dumb phone. But I also have an iPhone, so I'm cheating a little bit. <laughs> but the reason why I ask you that is because ultimately, we're all connected, right? Like we have Facebook, we have Twitter, we have Tinder. We have all these things. <laughs> but the truth is, I have found that real connection happens between two human beings, or three, or in nature, or with animals, dogs, who, ha who has a pet. So you know how powerful the connection is when you have a, with, with a pet. Um, and we live in this uber-connected world, yet I found on my travels that we are as a society, specifically in the Western world, at times super disconnected. We have forgotten the most powerful thing about humanity, which is about connecting with each other. And the title of this speech is I See You, The Power of Human Connection. And around my trips around Earth, because I'm going to tell you what that means in a minute. Around my trips around Earth, I learnt that if there is one thing that connects us all, and if there is one thing that we all have inside us, it is the desire and the need to be seen. The desire and the need to feel connected. Not on Facebook. Not that there's anything wrong with Facebook, because there isn't. 
not on Instagram, but here, right now, with another human being. And that's really what my speech is about today. It's about connection. I feel lost inside myself. Who's ever been in pain? So pretty much everyone, we're human beings. When I give my speeches in schools, I talk about my pain. And I talk about how, as a kid, I was very, very disconnected, and how, as a kid, I was very lonely, and as how, as a kid, I never connected. I was bullied, and all this kind of stuff. And sometimes kids have uh, short attention spans. So I tell them this right at the beginning. And I say to them, if you don't listen to anything else I say to you, don't forget what I'm about to share. And there's a hush silence. And basically what I share with them is that we all have pain. And we all at times feel lonely. Yet most of us don't share that pain with other people. We wear this mask where on the outside everything is wonderful and rosy. But on the inside it's far from wonderful and it's far from rosy. And I believe that unless we find a way to share our pain with someone safe, it builds and it builds and it builds and it builds. And one day that mask will crack. And pray that one day that mask does crack. Because if it doesn't crack, we go through our lives every single moment with this, with this pain sitting there, without being able to share it with someone, without being able to open up to someone. And I tell the kids, I say to them, tell somebody. Tell a teacher, tell a parent, tell a friend, don't let it sit and don't sit behind that mask. Sometimes the biggest courage that we can find is to share our pain. Because everyone has pain, but some people don't share it. I would say most people don't share it. And I wouldn't be sitting here today if my pain didn't push me out of sitting behind that desk. Um, so sometimes pain is a, is, 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 a, is a good thing and it's a transformative thing. So when you see this picture, what do you feel? A few of you, just tell me what you feel. Or none of you. <laughs> Excitement, okay? Freedom. freedom. Who said freedom? Freedom. Like it. Adventure. Adventure. Okay. What else? Friendship. Friendship. What else? <coughs> One more. Happiness. Who said that? Happiness. Happiness. Okay. So I was sitting behind a desk, feeling the total opposite, oh my god, feeling the total opposite of this. And I had a business meeting, and my business meeting fortunately was cancelled. What a shame. It's like being at school and hearing the school is out early. It's so sad. And I went back home, and I saw, I uh, turned on the TV, and I watched this movie called The Motorcycle Diaries, which was a romanticized version of Che Guevara traveling around the world relying on kindness. And in that moment, I was like, I was, I was thinking to myself, I was like, wow, I'm a, I'm, I think I'm having an epiphany. It turned out I was. And the epiphany was, even though this was, sim even though this was simply a movie, the epiphany was that if this chap, in the movie, can live 
free. And I can feel the feelings that you guys were, fe were saying when you saw this. If I can feel that, then, they, then it's real and it can, I can actually do something different in my life. And I remember, I remember crying and thinking to myself, wow, there is a, there is a different way. So I decided, not on the spot, well, pretty much on the spot, actually. Like, inside me, I decided. It didn't happen on the spot with the decision, but it was, like, inside me. And I realized, I said, you know what, I can't do this anymore. I'm going to quit my job. I'm going to go out into the world, and I'm going to start living as fully as I possibly can. So I did just that. I quit my job, and I started to live as fully as I could. My first little adventure was I went from... Times Square to the Hollywood sign on five dollars a day, relying entirely on the kindness of strangers. At the moment, at that moment, I didn't realize fully what I was doing. But looking back at it, I took away all my money so that the shy little kid that didn't know how to connect was forced to connect with people. I forced myself to connect with people. And it's one thing to sit. In your, on your couch in London and come up with a plan to travel across America. It's another thing to be in Times Square and be like, okay, this is bad. I have to get to LA with basically no money. Um, but I had two choices in that moment. First choice was to go home and continue living the way I was living. And the second choice was to say, you know what? I'm just going to go for it. And whatever happens, happens. That's what I did. I went for it. And I managed to get to LA, met unbelievable people. In fact, a story that I want to share with you about Indianapolis is that I met this lady in Indianapolis who said to me, I told her I was going to Chicago. She said, if you can find your way to Chicago, I will give you my only set of keys to my house, because she lived in Chicago, but she was here for a wedding. You can stay in my house. You can eat the chili from my fridge. You can stay on my couch. And the next morning, give me, put the keys in the flower pot, and I'll pick them up when I get there. It's like, all right. I'm not sure I would have done that, but she did. And I share that story with you because that kind of act of kindness, that kind of human connection, just like opened up my heart. And I never thought it was possible that people could be like that. So I got to LA, and as you know, sometimes we want change to just happen. Like make a decision, I wanna change. All right, change. Doesn't always happen that way. So I ended up in LA, doing what I used to do, sitting behind a desk. I was still feeling a little, I was, I, was, I was better, I was better inside, still had everything on the outside, better inside, but still not fully there. And that is when I came up with this. So, I remember I was walking down um, Hollywood Boulevard and I saw this chap with a sign, and the sign said, kindness is the best medicine. And there was something in that message, so simple. Kindness is the best medicine. And I realized that some of the journeys I'd done in the past were about receiving kindness. And that this journey, or the journey I was formulating in my head, had to be something where it was a reciprocal thing, giving and receiving. So I came up with this idea that I would purchase a vintage yellow motorbike. I would call it Kindness One, sort of like Air Force One, but yellower. And I would travel from Los Angeles all the way around the world back to Los Angeles with no money, no food, no gas, nothing. Just kindness. I thought it was a good idea at the time. Um, but there would be a twist. And the twist was that unsuspecting Good Samaritans would receive a life-changing gift. Not everyone, because then I'd bankrupt myself. 
but a few people, and you're going to meet some of them in a, in a moment. And I, I remember being really excited. I was finally going to break free. I was going to quit my job again, but this time forever. And uh, I was going to really start doing what I wanted to do. So I went back to my girlfriend's house, my house actually, she was in it. And um, I said to her, I told her this, I was like so excited. We're going to travel around the world, I'm going to be away for six months, I'm really, really happy. And she starts crying. And I'm like, what the f I don't, I'm like, I just don't get this. I'm doing this, and I just don't get it. A couple of months ago, I told this story to a, to a, to a lady, um, and she said to me, she said, Leon, I don't think you understand women very well. <laughs> I was like, I was like, yeah, I don't think I do. So obviously she was upset because I was going away for six months. Um, I sorted it out with her and I decided that I was going to go anyway. And um, I had to pay for the visas, because imagine arriving in Turkey and saying, can you let me into your country free? No, we cannot. Um, I had to pay for the passport of the bike, because the pass bike needed the passport. And I had to find a way to cross the oceans. So I would speak to, I spoke to multiple container shipping companies. They all said no. And I was like, well, that's the end. But I was like, yeah, that's not the end. <laughs> I decided, I kept going, and I found one company that took me across the Atlantic with the bike and across the Pacific with the bike. And then the journey began. And then the person that you're going to meet next really epitomizes, and ultimately I'm going to show you a video at the end of this, but the person that you're going to meet next really epitomizes why I did what I did. So I was in Pittsburgh trying to find a place to stay. We go up to people and say, can I live in your house? And they'd say no, obviously. But I'd find this guy and I said to him, can I live in your house? And he looks at me and he says, you know, I'm really sorry, but I'm homeless. So in that moment, I felt a lot of shame because here I was doing a social experiment. I had what I needed at home, but in reality, here was a man that had nothing, had no home, had no nothing in real life. But then he did something that was truly extraordinary. He turned around to me and he said, if you want, you can stay with me tonight. I'll protect you, I'll feed you, and I'll give you some clothes. Okay. Do I want to spend the night on the streets of Pittsburgh with someone I've never met in my life? My mind was like, no, you do not, Leon. Keep going and find someone else. My heart and my intuition, more importantly, was like, you must stay with this man. So I followed my intuition and I stayed with him. And he did everything he said he would do and more. And he taught me the most powerful lesson I've had the pleasure of learning. That true wealth is not in our wallets, but it's in our hearts. Does that mean that money is not important? Of course not. Money is very important. But what it means is that here was a man with nothing on the outside, yet truly with everything on the inside. He had a kindness to him. A heart, a, a, his heart was so big. And I remember in the morning, he said to me, I said to him, I said, Tony, how did you sleep? And he said, well, I didn't really sleep very well. I was like, why? And he said, well, I kept on waking up and I, I kept on picking off the bugs off you. Because at night, obviously, on the streets there are bugs. And I was like, whoa, OK. Again, a man with nothing showed so much kindness and love and he had no idea what was coming I didn't tell him that maybe he's going to receive something in return he had no idea I said to him I said Tony I want you to take me somewhere where you felt loved so he thought about it for a moment he's like well 
I felt loved at my school, which was literally about 500 meters from where he was sleeping every night for years on end. So I took him to a school and I told him the truth. And I told him that there were people that I met that I wanted to give back to. That there were people that I felt connected to that I wanted to give back to. There were people that were kind in their heart and their soul that I wanted to give back to. And I had the honor of being able to put him back in an apartment and send him back to school. He wanted to be a chef. And to this day, he calls me up from time to time. And he says to me, he says, Leon, you changed my life. And I say to him, Tony, my friend, what you don't understand is that you are the one that changed my life. A simple act of kindness can truly change a life. And his act of showing me what it's like to come from your heart did what that movie did for me all those years ago. Showed me that if he can do it, and he's sitting on the streets, then why can't I do it? And why can't you do it? And he changed my life in that respect. I did a speech a couple of weeks ago. I think it was a couple of weeks ago. I'm not sure anymore. And um, there was an exchange student, maybe 14 years old, Indian girl. I had told her how, because sometimes I talk about how I was bullied as a kid and how I spent a lot of my years in high school eating by myself in the library. And this girl came up to me, I signed my book. Then I get a message from her on Facebook. And this is an example how one person can change a life. She says to me, Mr. Leon, I want to let you know that I used to sit outside for three months, the gymnasium, eating by myself. And I had absolutely no friends, zero. And after your speech, two people came up to me and said, will you be my friend? And now I have two friends. And a couple of days later, she sends me another Facebook message. And she says, Mr. Leon, I want you to know that now I have four friends. Because those two friends had introduced her to another two friends. So one person went up to her and changed the, the direction of her life. And that's the truth. Because she could have gone home to India after spending three months, six months, nine months sitting behind the gymnasium without a single friend. But one person decided that they would go up to her and say, will you be my friend? And change the direction and the trajectory of how she's going to live. And that's a powerful thing. And everyone in this room can do that. Every single one of us. When I see you, my heart smiles. You know, I try and keep, I try and, I try and keep uh, the talks as positive as I can without telling everyone that, you know, that just kindness in the world and that all you have to do is be kind and everything will work itself out. But as you all know, kindness is not universal. Um, who's been to Cambodia? Oh, you've been to Cambodia. Did you go to Phnom Penh? Did you go to the killing fields? Okay. So normally I don't share this story, but I feel an urge to share it. So there's people like Tony, and there's people who got me all the way to Cambodia. Good people. And then there's situations that you find in the killing fields in Cambodia and you find in Auschwitz. You find the total opposite of goodness. You find evil. There's a tree in Cambodian, one of the Cambodian killing fields called the killing tree. I share about this in my book. And to be honest with you, I nearly took it out. I thought, I'm not sure if, if I should put this in the book. 
Even though it happened, I'm not sure I should put it in. But you know what? I decided to keep it in. And there's a killing tree. And it's called the killing tree because the, they used to take kids and kill them on the tree in front of their mother's eyes. Two million people were killed in a couple of years by Pol Pot and the Khmer Rouge. And maybe an extreme case, but we all have a choice. We can go down that road, which it's a long road to reach the end of the killing tree, but still, you can go down that road. Or you can go down another road, a road where you take personal responsibility for how you treat yourself. You take personal responsibility for how you treat others. It's your choice. Same with that person, the first person that asked the Indian girl, will you be my friend? If she hadn't asked that girl, will you be my friend, who knows what would have happened. But she made that choice, small choice, will you be my friend. So the reason why I talk about the um, killing tree today is because ultimately the world can be a dark place. You see the news, you see all this kind of stuff. But we have a choice, everyone has a choice. And if we magnify the darkness, then all we think is this dark thing's going on. But if we magnify the goodness, then it cha changes everything, changes our perspective, changes the way we see the world. Who's been to Vietnam? Okay. Oh, you've been there as well? Oh, wow, <laughs> lovely. Who's been to the Mok Bai border? Okay, the Mok Bai border is the land border between Cambodia and Vietnam. And I remember arriving there, and uh, remember how I told you about the visas and the passport of the bike. So he looks at my, my, my visa, and he's smiling. And he looks at my passport of the bike, and he's, he's not smiling which is bad. He keeps on like smiling and then not smiling. And then he looks at me and he says, you yes, bike no. Okay. You yes, bike no. That's obviously bad news because I've been traveling for like God knows how many thousands of miles and the guy won't give me the bike. So I, I try, I try everything in my Englishness to charm this man to give me the bike. He refuses. So I say to him, you know what, please give me the big chief. So a little small chap comes out, wide. And I decide to go to DEFCON 3. DEFCON 3 is, look, my kids, they need their father. You must help me. I don't have any kids. <laughs> DEFCON 3 didn't work. I was like, okay, DEFCON 2. Another chief comes out. I say, look, my wife, I'm telling you she's going to divorce me if you don't give me the bike. Of course, I don't have a wife. Um, well, I didn't then, and I still don't. Um, and then I was like, DEFCON 1, which is war. But for me, it was a, kind, a kindness war. But it was still war. It's like, I have, to, I have to get this bike out. Whatever I have to do, I have to make this man feel sorry for me. I have to connect with him in some way. So I was on the cusp of faking a heart attack <laughs> so that he would feel kind, some kindness towards me. Like, how can I not help this man? He's dying. But I didn't. I didn't do it. I couldn't. Uh, and in the end, I left the bike in the, in, the, in the container and I went into Ho Chi Minh City. But the reason why I'm sharing the story is because ultimately, I was saved by the Americans. You may ask yourself, how the hell was, were, was I saved by the Americans in, uh, in Ho Chi Minh City? I've traveled across America many, many times, the Midwest, all areas of America. And I found there's a generosity of spirit in this country that's truly second to none. 
I had a choice. Do I go to the American Embassy or the English Embassy? I'm being filmed, so I should be careful what I say. <laughs> but I realized that if I went to the British Embassy, I probably wouldn't be helped. And I knew that if I went to the American Embassy and I told them the truth, no children, no wives, no sudden panic attacks, and I told them about the gifts. Normally I didn't tell people about the gifts, but I told them everything. I knew they'd help me. I just felt it, that they would help. And that's exactly what happened. To cut a long story short, it reached the US ambassador, the level of the US ambassador to Vietnam. I had pissed off an entire nation. But the US ambassador, with his help, I got the bike out. And I ended up traveling to uh, wherever I ended up. But this little story, I met a lady on the uh, street and uh, she bought me some noodles in Vietnam. And she introduced me to someone that was truly exceptional. A truly exceptional individual. Remember what I, what I said at the beginning that one of the main reasons I did this was about the power of being seen. Well, here was a man who dedicated and giving, who dedicated his life, who dedicates his life to giving back to people. Every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, he gives free eyesight surgery to poor Vietnamese farmers. Farmers that without him would go blind and stay blind. In America, we have cataracts, pretty simple procedure to fix. In Vietnam, pretty simple procedure to fix. But if you haven't got any money, it's a pretty impossible thing to fix. And what I found so exceptional was that I was sitting in this, in this guy's, I don't look very happy here for some reason, I don't know why. But I was sitting in this guy's office, and he said to me, he told me everything he was doing, he let me go into his surgery place, and I was feeling this surge of like desire to help. So I said to him, I said, I will help fund 100 surgeries. And in that moment, I was like, oh my God, what have I done? Literally, I was like, oh my God, like how am I gonna get out of this? How on earth am I gonna pay for 100 surgeries? I mean, that's madness. I mean, here it costs, what, $1,000 to do a, uh, an eyesight surgery? That's $100,000. I was like, shit, I'm, I've got to find my way out of this. And then, I, and then I was like, how much is a surgery? And he said, $30. $30. So, of course, I was very happy for myself. <laughs> but what was more profound? was that the, everyone you see in that picture behind me doesn't have $30 to fix their eyesight. And without people like him, they would stay blind. We are so lucky in, this, uh, in America. We are so lucky in the Western world in so many ways. $30. It was just, to me, it was just mind-blowing. So after this slide, I'm going to show you a, uh, a little video. Sometimes, I am a little bit melodramatic. <laughs> Sometimes. This was one of those moments I'm about to share with you. So I was sitting at a... Uh, I was sitting outside this really beautiful building in Vietnam, Ho Chi Minh City. I hadn't got my bike out yet. And I, I was having a little bit of a moment, which I'd exaggerated into a big moment. And some guy comes out, and he's like, are you OK? I'm like, yeah, I'm OK. I told him my story. And he sat there, and he said to me, this is the opera house. If you want, tonight, come to the opera. I was like. All right, Who, whoever gets invited to the opera and just so happens to be in Vietnam in Ho Chi Minh City. I said, okay, I'll do it. So I, I spend the rest of the day being melodramatic and I end up going to the opera. And he says to me, go and sit up there and watch the show. He's like, okay. And then he comes 10 minutes before the end, taps me on the shoulder and he says, do you want to be in the show? 
And I was like, do I want to be in the show? Yeah. All right. So he gives me these um, drums, like the Vietnamese drums, and he says, go out and play your heart out. And I was like, man, do you know that I don't know how to play the drums? <laughs> and uh, he's like, it doesn't matter. Just go. So the last 10 minutes of the show, I'd say five minutes probably, I went out and I started playing the drums with so much passion, just letting it all out. Of course, I was useless, but it didn't matter because I let all the frustration and everything out. And at the end of the little drum session, there was a uh, standing ovation. Now, trust me, the standing ovation was not because I was very good. The standing ovation was because I was the only white guy on the stage, and they knew something odd was going on. Um, but the reason why I share that story is because it was in that moment, during the standing ovation, that everything came full circle. I thought back to myself. I thought back to myself. I thought back to my encounter with Tony, a homeless man who pretty much is never seen. Pretty much every day, we walk past the homeless as if they don't exist. Tony felt totally unseen. As a kid, I, and I'm sure some of you, have felt totally unseen. And in that moment, as I was like having my moment in the sun, and I felt seen, and it kind of had this experiential thing that happened, I was like, wow, that's it. The most important thing is to be seen. And it took me sleeping on the streets just for one night. Here's a man that's done it for 10 years. It took me one night sleeping on the streets and one crazy night at the opera in Ho Chi Minh City to fully integrate that into who I am and how important it is for every single one of us to feel seen. So now I'm going to show you a video. Can we turn the lights off? We don't have to. I think you can pretty much see it, but it doesn't matter. My name is Leo. I was living an uninspiring life on Wall Street, sitting behind a slab of wood, crunching numbers. I decided that there must be more to life. Kindness One and I are about to embark on an epic journey, a journey powered solely by kindness. <laughs> Can I live in your house tonight? Unfortunately, I don't have a house. I'm homeless right now. Can I take this blanket here? We want to put you up in a house, enroll you in some kind of certificate program where you can make your way again in life. So, Willie, why the kindness, man? I don't know. It's just something I've always been raised with. How does Willie help your life? How does that make you feel? I feel like a <laughs> we want to pay for you to go to England for your son's wedding. Mm, joke. I'm absolutely not joking. That's an answer to prayer. Can I be cheeky and give you a kiss on the cheek goodbye? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I can turn the other cheek too. Okay. <laughs> Very random question. Are you a cowboy? Oh no! This is bad! I can't believe that I'm in the saved the city of Sarajevo. Giving sight to the poor for free is beyond words. We will fund 100 surgeries. You need to help me, I'm serious. Ah, the bike is finished, I need to find a mechanic. I literally haven't eaten in a day. Can I stay with you tonight? Are we there yet? Can I spend the night in your house tonight? Do you speak English? The life of an Indian farmer is not for me. Yes! My son! I'm going to free you! 
and we're missionaries, we would love to offer a place for you to stay tonight. They were all the way from Hollywood on kindness. Hey, Hare Gandhi. You are staying with us tonight. Welcome. Our kindness. To I you. would kiss you, but I would. Oh, no, you wouldn't. No, you wouldn't. But I would hug you. I would hug you. We are going to build her a house. It's true. This is real. It's going to happen. Nothing this is like Martin Minot. Did you go to school with him? Yeah. Thank you. They say that giving is better than receiving. And in many ways that's true. So I'm going to open it up in a moment to some questions. But before I do, I want to reiterate one last time how one single human being can affect change. Did another speech at a school. And a, a girl sent me a Facebook message and she said to me, I have been bullied since eighth grade by one chap. After your speech, this chap came up to me and apologized. Told me that I looked beautiful and carried my books to my next class. Every single one of us, no matter how old we are, can make a difference in someone's life. Whether it be small or whether it be big. And every single one of us can do the opposite. It's up to you which one you choose. Thank you. So now open it up to any questions you may or may not have. Was your life ever in danger? Was my life ever in danger? When I was 22, I went to Thailand and I was with a friend. And a tuk-tuk driver came up to us, a rickshaw driver. And my friend said, let's get in the tuk-tuk. The guy said, I'll take you somewhere. And I said, no, let's not. And he's like, no, let's, let's do it. I'm like, man, let's not. And he's like, no, let's do it. I was like, all right, fine, whatever, let's do it. The guy ended up taking us to an illegal opium den. And I share that story because Ever since that day, and throughout my travels, my intuition has kept me safe. Um, and most people would think, are you insane for sleeping on the streets in Pittsburgh with someone you don't know, in a park that you were told specifically not to go to during the day? But I knew that he would help me, and he would protect me, and if anything happened, he would protect me. In the first paragraph of my book, shows that. So I never put myself, I take calculated risks, but I never take stupid risks. Well, I don't know, maybe driving a motorbike around the world is, could be considered a stupid risk. But, so, so not really. But five days after I left this Indian town in Patna, called Patna, a bomb went off, killed eight people. So your intuition can keep you safe to a degree. But life is life, and you never know what happens. Do you still have your yellow motorbike? I do still have my yellow motorbike. It's sitting in my garage. And I have like a love-hate relationship with the bike, because it kept breaking down. And currently, it doesn't like me, because I'm being 
not really being very friendly to it because it's there and I'm here. So. a good question. I think I would say ultimately it's just about seeing someone, how, how you see them and how you connect with them. And kindness sometimes evokes like, oh, you know, I'm going to give you this or I'm going to do this for you. But it's really about your presence around someone and how you treat someone and how you show up for someone. Um, I think the kindest thing ultimately that we can do for each other is simply to be present. Like sometimes I see um, kids with their parents and I know that the kid is happy. I can feel it. There's a presence that the parent gives to the child. You feel it. And sometimes I see kids that are not happy and the parent is not present for that child. And it's such a simple thing, yet it's not so simple. Because ultimately, like I talked about pain, when you're in pain, you can't be there for someone else. It's very, very difficult to be there for someone else when you are yourself suffering. So I would say that they're a little, ultimately it's universal, but I would say that obviously there are different ways of showing it. Like in some cultures, slaughtering a goat and giving it to you may be kindness. In America, that would not be considered very kind. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, that is an excellent question. Have you read the book? No. Because, uh, because there's a big theme in the book about home. Um, home. Hmm. I, w I would say that for me, Some people say to me that my journeys are a way for me to run, to run away, and not to stay focused, stay grounded, and be present. And when a problem happens, I just get on the road. And there is an element of truth to that. But to answer your question about home, It's really where I feel the most connected. Like I can be on I-5 trillion, whatever, in some like middle of nowhere, and I can have someone next to me and I can feel home, you know? Um, or I can be at home and feel home. But it's really the feeling of connectivity that really determines whether or not I feel at home. I don't know if that answered your question. Thank you. You mentioned some kind words about um, finding kindness in the United States. What do you think that is about our culture? How you felt so many people come to you with kindness? Many words. Or besides having an nice British accent, why do you think people <laughs> here are uh, um, so kind? I think there is an an innocence about America in the sense that you know you guys have been around for 245 years whereas France has been around for 3,000 years and England for 4,000 years and wars have happened in Europe over and over and over again and in America, you've had wars, but certainly not the same as they have in Europe. Um, and I think that, that there's, there's no perfection. I'm not saying you guys are perfect, so. <laughs> but I'm saying that there's an innocence about, and there's, a, there's just an innocence and a, a lack of, this isn't universal, but a lack of cynicism I know that if I went and gave this speech in England, the 
the kind of questions I would receive would be totally different from the kind of questions I receive here. In the sense that the questions I would receive, not that the English aren't kind, because I did this around England and they were very kind, but there's a heaviness in Europe and around the world, whereas in America there's, there's this lightness, this just lightness. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to live here. Um, and because people like my English accent, <laughs> which I've made an, uh, an effort to keep as often as I can. <laughs> I remember once I, I, went to a, um, I went to a restaurant and I said, can I have a tomato? And I was like, oh my god. I was like, no. And for like the next five days, I was like, tomato, 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 <laughs> tomato. Give me a tomato. <laughs> so I do make an effort. It does help. It really helps. It helps me in many areas. My question is to you, Jim, compared to the last two. OK. <laughs> How did you choose those countries in this country? I mean, why this one and not the other one? Sure, sure. One of the things I was thinking was doing Russia mm -hmm. would have made it a lot simpler with visas. I mean, simply go to Europe, go to Russia, go all the way to the east, and then go to Alaska, end. But I don't like doing things the easy way. <laughs> so I decided to do it the hard way. Um, and I kind of picked countries that I'd never been to and I wanted to visit. Um, uh, so yeah, that's... And I knew, obviously, LA all the way around to LA. So obviously, Africa was out, because there was no point. Certain like islands were out, because why on earth would I go to an island to make it even more hard? Um, so it kind of just was like a straight line-ish. Does that make sense? What do you think's next for you? What do I think's next? Well, basically, I will be driving a, a, a yellow Land Rover from South Africa to Finland, doing the same thing I did for the Kindness Diaries, but with a twist. Instead of me funding the gifts, it'll be you. So it'll be on a platform like Yahoo. I will go and do the journey. And for example, let's say Tony was in Africa. I'd meet Tony, take a video of him for maybe a minute and a half, two minutes, explain what he needed, put it on the Yahoo, and for 30 days, you guys have the ability to fund his gift. So you can give $1, $3, $8, $10, whatever. Um, but it'll be a, like a community effort. That, that, that's the next thing. Any more? What's your greatest? You're an Aussie? Yes. You're an Aussie. <laughs> My greatest challenge right now. I would say that my greatest challenge is ultimately to embody everything that I'm speaking about. Um, and when I come and I do these speeches, I can't go out into the world and be a prick because I'm like, you just gave this speech about kindness. How can you go out in the world and just not be kind? Again, it doesn't mean I'm perfect because I'm not. But I don't, and to be honest with you, I don't even think it's a challenge anymore. It's just kind of. something that, that I actually enjoy. I enjoy, like, I'm in, I'm, in the, I'm in the lift. Maybe in the past, I'd be in the lift and I wouldn't talk to the bellboy. I'd just, like, do my own thing. But now, I'm like, man, you just gave a speech to 800 kids about being kind and how a little smile can change a life. Just be kind to this chap for 35 seconds. So I think that, like, embodying it really fully. Which part of Australia are you from? Queensland. Sorry that we beat you in the ashes. We'll see about that. <laughs>
<laughs> oh God. Any more? I got to you one about college. Okay. So where did you study for college? Maybe what, what advice or, or what, what last, I don't know, piece of advice would you give for a young person going through this college experience? Sure. Well, I studied in two colleges. The first college was in England for one and a half years. And then I studied in Boston for two and a half years. And I studied business management, which is like every business course I took, I was like, why am I here? I don't want to be here. I don't want to be doing this. Like, why am I here? And there were reasons why I was there, but ultimately I'd say this. When I was 16, I went to a new school and I sat in an auditorium. And a lady came in and gave a speech. And her speech was about her son. Her son was 23 years old, was killed in Somalia during the Black Hawk Down incident. He was a photographer. And here was a kid, 23, adult, whatever, who went out and lived fully, inspired people, gave back, took photographs that changed the world. And the speech was not about his death. The speech was about his life. And in that moment, I realized, again, like that movie, hold on, if this guy can do it, if this guy can go out and live and be, then why can't I? And this guy was living his life, not someone else's, his life. What he was put on this earth to do. And I would say to the college kids, don't live someone else's life. <laughs> okay. Um, you obviously approached many, many, many people, regardless of culture. Did you find that women responded to you differently? Women are taught to protect themselves. Sure. Sure. <laughs> Traveling <laughs> on yellow motorbikes. Sure. You know, that's a, it's a very good question, and again, it goes back to kind of like intuition and feeling the person. There were certain women that I wouldn't approach, like a woman with a child. Nine times out of 10, I wouldn't go there because I don't want them to feel uncomfortable. Their priority is their kid, and me coming up to them and asking them for something may make them feel unsafe. But in other situations, there were women who were I don't know, maybe with some friends, then I would maybe go up to them. It all depended on the situation. Um, it all depended on the situation. But I would speak to women. I would, well, you know, for example, in India, I wouldn't because it's not okay for me to like go up to a woman and like start talking to her and telling her what I'm doing because someone may get pissed at me. So I wouldn't do that. But in America, it's a bit different. If you can find a situation where the woman feels safe, then yeah. it's okay to do that. But in, in India, it was always men I would speak to. I remember I was in Uzbekistan, not for this journey, for another journey. And it's different, our cultures are different. And I was lost. Um, and I went up to some random man, and I started talking to him. He, didn't sp he hardly spoke any English. But he realized I was in trouble, and he invited me to come and stay with him. And I stayed with him. He was a melon seller on the street, on the, on the, on the highway, if you can call it a highway, of some Uzbekistani town. And he invited all his friends. He invited everyone. And I spent the night having a, um, eating and, and, and being present with this chap. It's like maybe 15 people, not one woman. His wife, all she did, it was like she was a, 
she was a um, like she was a helper, like it wasn't his wife. But I found that odd. But that's their culture. So who am I to tell him to do something different? So each culture you go to, you kind of work through and figure out. You have another one? You said you had a few. Sure. Um, but do you think people who said no because you write about the people who said no because you write about all day long I'm asking for a place to stay does that mean that they're not trusting you as a person or could they just be not in the moment no absolutely not yeah. some of them may be evil but most of them just have stuff to do right. and why would you help me like why truthfully if someone came up to me in the middle of the street the chances are I wouldn't help. That was my lesson. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'd be like, it depends on the mood and the moment. You know? Uh, who's heard of couch surfing? Okay. Have you ever had anyone couch surf your house? Uh, okay. So, couch surfing is a site, a free site, where you find people around the world. And let's say you're in Indianapolis. You go onto couch surfing and you say, Can I stay on your couch? And I am a couch surfer. I have people stay with me and I sometimes stay with others. And a lot of people think I'm crazy. They're like, you don't even know these people. But the truth is, again, about intuition. I've never had a bad experience on couch surfing. I've never had a person in my house that's done anything bad. I've never been to someone's house that's done anything bad. And there were times when I I literally, my friends, they think I'm mad. Like I meet someone who I've never met before. And I'm gonna look, I've got to go to a business meeting. Here are the keys to my house. I'll come back in three hours. Just make yourself at home. And they think I'm crazy. But you just know. I know. There were some people, like there was, it's interesting. There was a couch surfer that asked me to stay at my house. A lot of people ask. And I said no to him. It just didn't feel right. I just said, I made some excuse. I was like, I'm sorry, I, I'm not going to be there. And it turned out that this guy went to a, a hostel and randomly met a friend of mine and, and came to my house. Yeah, not to stay, just to, to be there. And when I met him, I was like, I know why I did not say yes to you. I didn't say that to him. But in my, in my mind, I was like, I know why I didn't say yes. So it was like proof that our intuition actually really works. If we are fully in tune with it, it really works. So on the trip, you asked for help, you asked for help with gas, food, and a place to stay. So when you compare to the three, if you consider that that's three types of quests, uh, do, do you think one is relatively easier than others? Because oftentimes when you talk about generosity or the willingness of offering the Yeah. The hardest thing was gas. Because gas is like you had a you had a gas station and you go up to someone, there's no real connection. Can you help me? Staying at someone's house, you meet them, you kind of have a, a connection with them. But gas was just like that. And that was the hardest thing. But they would give me gas in the morning. So for example, if I stayed with someone, he would, they would give me gas and I would keep going. But it's like the random gas things were a challenge. How do you respond now to other stories about people who always feel that you're doing more than he's asking you to do? What do you mean? Whether if someone walks up to you on the street or sees something in your mind. Sure. No, I don't. I can't give to everyone. If the moment feels right, then I will. But there are times when I, I don't. Like I said, I'm, I'm not standing here in front of you telling you that I'm Gandhi, because I'm not. Um, when I can help, I will. And if I'm busy or I can't, I, I can't. So I try my best, but I don't do it all the time.
Sure, good question. Uh, the longest I went without food was a day. You have to understand, I, was, I, I, had, I, I got the yellow motorbike on purpose. And I got the yellow motorbike with a sidecar so that people could connect with me. They're like, wow, what the hell's that? And we start talking, tell them the story, the rest is history. But there are times when I failed. I remember I was in Lake Como and I was trying everything in my power, my, my like, just please. For hours, I was in the town trying to find some help. No one would help. Not because they're mean, because they just couldn't. And I ended up sleeping in my sidecar in Lake Como. It wasn't fun, but I did have an early morning shower in Lake Como or bath. Any more? Mm. And through your travels, you're making uh, several connections that are free, but powerful. So I guess my question is, do you feel more connected to yourself? To myself? Yeah, to yourself and to your life. That's a good question. I definitely, definitely feel more connected to myself. One of the things that's helped me feel more connected to myself is giving talks and, and speaking. Um, that has helped me. Um, and the thing I said about embodying everything that I'm t talking about, because I don't want to talk about it and then not do it. Um, but it's sometimes easier to connect with a stranger than it is to connect with someone that you care about. Because um, when you care about someone, there's emotions start flaring up. Um, and that's when a challenge, the challenges really happen. And, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. In India, people could not believe that I didn't have any money. They just didn't believe it. They're like, how can you not have money? You're white. They thought I was American. You're from America. How can you not have any money? Now, of course, we know it was a social experiment, and I did have money at home. Um, but there were moments, of course, where people don't believe. And it's all about safety. And once you can show them that they're safe, like just a little thing. For example, if this is someone, and I was walking up to them, I always have a, a, an extra distance between me and them when I walk up. And I'm very, so that they feel completely safe. And I'm very, um, have a way of kind of like, if they don't want to help, it's not a problem. Don't worry. Thank you so much. Thank you for even listening to me. And I kind of give them all the power so that they don't feel in any way that they are not safe and that I am going to do anything that is going to put their safety at risk. So it's about how you approach that. Like if I went up like this, like, hey, how are you doing? Can you help me? It's going to be like, no, of course I can't help you. Please leave. So it's about how you show up. In life, really, it's how you show up. That's the power of how you show up. Um, I'm curious, this adventure, both in uh, the US and abroad, as a white male, there would be some times where that'd be very advantageous, and perhaps other times where it's not. What would be your thoughts on if someone who was not male or not white, sure. what kind of experiences they might have? It's an excellent question. And I'm sure that it would not be easy. Would not be as, as uh, it would be more difficult. But it would not be impossible. When I travel around the world, I see many women 
who are traveling alone. And I look at them, I'm like, wow. You know, that takes some balls, it takes some courage. But it can be done. Is it as easy as me doing it? No, it's not. And let's say you're an African American. Would that be as easy? I don't think so. Can it be done? Absolutely. Just be a little bit harder. And like in America, I, I have an English accent. I've yet to meet an American that doesn't like someone with an English accent. <laughs> so it helps, of course, I know. But that doesn't mean I shouldn't do it. Anyone else? Excellent question. Um, so if this were a Disney movie, this is what would happen to Tony. Tony would be in a nice house. He'd be owning his own restaurant, have a couple of kids maybe, lovely wife, and all would be wonderful. But this is not a Disney movie. This is life. And sometimes life slaps you in the face. Sometimes it punches you in the face. And the true test of how we deal with life is how quickly we get up and what we do with those punches. So Tony is in rehab. And some people may think, well, that's terrible. He's in rehab. But it's not. It's the best thing that could have happened to him. Because he now has a true opportunity to figure it all out. Because if you're taking, if you're doing the kind of things he was doing, you can't live. So that's where Tony is. Sorry, the Disney movie has been, ending has been ruined. <coughs> Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you.